I'm pleased to introduce today's speaker. Dr. Vikram Mancharmani is a global trend watcher and economic advisor who shares how to anticipate the future, manage risk, and spot opportunities. He encourages us all to zoom out from the narrow lens that often leads us to miss the most important signals that we're least primed to see. He's a global equity investor with 20 plus years experience, one of Worth Magazine's 100 most powerful people in global finance, and LinkedIn's number one top voice for money, finance, and global economics. He's a best-selling author, and his latest is Think for Yourself, Restoring Common Sense in an Age of Experts and AI. He's taught at Yale University, where he also earned his bachelor's degree before earning his PhD and two master's degrees from MIT. Uh, he's a smart guy, but you will find he is so accessible um, and really gonna enjoy this session. Today, he advises Fortune 500 CEOs, manages an investment partnership, teaches at Harvard University, and is here with us today to share his insights into the patterns and perspectives leading into our future to help us navigate uncertainty. Welcome, Vikram. Hi, Teresa. Thanks. Thanks for having me. I'm really excited to be with you all today and excited about sharing some of my thoughts. I was very happy to hear you say that the uh, the raffle would be uh, first prize would be one book because sometimes I get worried if, if if second prize would be two books that would that wouldn't make me feel so good and third prize three books that would be even worse. So in any case, uh, I do have my uh, presentation that I'm going to put up now if that's okay with everyone. Um, I will do that really quickly. Um, share this and get it up the full screen. So everyone should have my presentation in front of them now. Um, and what I'm going to do is spend probably 15 to 20 minutes, just a quick overview of the world as I see it today. Um, and again, how we got here will be part of that story. And then more importantly, what it means and where we may be going. And then I'll open it up to some questions uh, and happily uh, field whatever may be on your mind, even if it's something beyond the scope of what I just presented. So here's the world we're in. We know we've got talk of asset bubbles, there's a SPAC bubble, there's a, you know, do we have a debt bubble brewing? What's happening with equity markets? We're in the middle of a pandemic, there's a trade war, so they still going on? I don't know what's happening there. We've got negative rates, unemployment's higher than it should be, currency wars, et cetera. Um, so this is a world that seems chaotic, yet I wanna suggest to you that there are four key transitions underway in the world that can help explain the world we're in and a lot of those dynamics I just put on that prior slide. Number one, China. China has gone through a transition from an investment-led economy into a consumer-led economy. As a result, everything in the, cons the, con the sort of consumption stuff is booming, but the investment-oriented stuff, the lead, copper, steel, zinc, construction workers, et cetera, there's extra capacity there, and that's getting revealed. Number two, in technology, we're all seeing an acceleration of the use of technology. Just the mere fact that we're talking here remotely, virtually, uh, it suggests right there that technology is accelerating and having a greater impact. We're able to do more with less. Uh, so that's more supply. Number three, energy. We all know what's happening in alternative energies, but it's also happening in hydrocarbon energies, right? So we see more because of fracking and shale developments that there's more hydrocarbons available at the same time that power storage, solar, wind, et cetera, are enabling alternative energy to get lowered uh, in price and more uh, widely accessible. Uh, so alternative energy they're seeing, or energy generally, we're seeing more supply. And then fourthly, demographics. The world's largest economies are aging. We know that the United States, Europe, Russia, China, Japan, they're all aging. At the same time, uh, we've got some undercurrents going on in some of the emerging markets where they're fast growing and larger economies that are growing, uh, that are not as aging. They have younger populations. Uh, so what does that mean? All else equal, when people move to fixed incomes, they spend less, so that's less demand. So if I summarize it, extra supply, more supply, more energy, and less demand. So when everyone talks to you about inflation, I want to understand more supply, more supply, more supply, less demand. Why are we looking for inflation? We've got deflationary pressures. Again, I'm talking on a global aggregate basis. And so if you have deflation, here are four very obvious impacts that come out of it. Countries start using their currencies to compete against other currencies, other countries, excuse me, for the limited demand. So I want my currency to be lower than your currency so that the export markets take my output. Uh, inequality rises. There's winner-take-all markets. 
protectionism rises. If there's not enough demand in the world, we want to make sure that our supply gets to the markets it wants to and other production doesn't come in to take away the little bit of demand we have locally. And so that leads to trade wars. Fundamentally, we've all heard about how globalization may be in reverse. I want to suggest something else. The logic of globalization is what's at risk. There's been this bill of goods sold by the economists of the world to the populations of the world that said free trade, lower trade barriers, open markets, that will the tide will rise and all boats will benefit. Except it hasn't happened, right? The middle classes of the world in many places, not China, but in other places have been left behind. And as a result, there's this now new zero sum thinking logic, which is my win is your loss, your loss is my win. I don't care about the global economic pie. Talk to me about our slice. I don't really wanna talk about a pie. I wanna talk about slices. Um, and so you get zero sum thinking. That leads itself to a very fertile global dynamic of nationalism coming forth, right? So this fertile dynamic has laid the groundwork for politicians to come up and say, it's not your fault. Whose fault is it? Their fault. We need to make, insert country name, great again. Make America great again. Make Britain great again. Make Hungary great again. Make the Philippines great again. Make India great again. And so you get this us versus them mentality, but it gets worse than that. It also goes internal to the country where you say, it's us versus them. Who's them this time? It's them. The one percenters, they're the reason you, the middle class, are suffering. And so we get populism, the result of which is a really chaotic world where populism, nationalism, protectionism, currency wars, inequality, all of these dynamics were in place because of those four key transitions. And then in the midst of that, we get COVID-19. And so I want to now transition to spend a couple minutes talking about what does COVID-19 do to this thesis of where we were and where we're going? Bottom line, I think it's done one thing. It's accelerated, escalated, and intensified the very trends I've talked about, and the impacts are likewise getting intensified. So let's walk through that a little bit. Number one, inequality. Just look at today. The equity markets are near all-time highs. And yet unemployment is still elevated. Now, well, it's, it's going down. Got it. Unemployment's less. But talk to someone who works at a restaurant or in the travel industry or in a hotel. They're not feeling like it's getting better yet. And so there is this massive inequality that continues to persist. And that's creating pressure towards redistribution. Um, you know, I'm happy to talk about this some more if there's more questions about it. But it is absolutely, I mean, I'm, I'm here in Massachusetts and the US Senator who represents Massachusetts, Elizabeth Warren, has suggested a wealth tax. A wealth tax, taking from those who have, giving to those who need, is in fact the logic that imbued Karl Marx and you know his thinking. And it's why I put the hammer and sickle here, right? I mean, it's a matter of degree, um, but we're, we're seeing pressures for redistribution. And that is coming. And that's probably actually not that unhealthy because it could help mitigate some of the inequality. It's also causing a rethink in corporate boardrooms. There's this dynamic of, oh, we've been focused on shareholder performance, shareholder performance. We represent the shareholders. Well, hold on a second. Now we've got the world's largest asset manager asking the question of what is the purpose of a company, purpose and profit. And then at least uh, one of the largest CEO groups in the world that represents some of the largest multinational corporations, the Business Roundtable, came forth and put out a statement on the purpose of a company. I thought we all knew it was for shareholder benefit. Well, now there's this debate, shareholder, stakeholder, uh, and we're shifting towards more stakeholder. I'm happy to take this further in questions if there are any, but I actually think this is a misframing counterproductive articulation of the problem. Uh, because I actually think it's a short-term versus long-term thinking that's the problem. Because in the long-term, of course you care about your shareholders, but you definitely also care about your employees. You care about your environment. You care about your community because you're living in that space and you're breathing that air. So you're definitely going to care about it all in the long run. So it might just be a short-termism problem. But again, happy to come back to that and delve deeper if people wish. Uh, so what else was happening? Well, we knew that there were dynamics like co-working underway before COVID. Well, that's accelerated into remote working. 
one of the largest companies in the United States that I've done a bunch of advisory work for has roughly 30 million square feet of office space around the world. They're planning on reducing it by 20 to 30% in the next five years without any change of employee count. That's a huge impact on the commercial real estate market. That's a huge impact, impact on sort of everything that supports that market. And so we got to think about real estate possibly differently. Think about this. Look at these four pictures. These were four pictures of cities that I've traveled to that I never in my life thought I would see. Empty, deserted streets with very few, if any, people. I mean, Mumbai, I've been to Mumbai dozens of times. I don't think I've ever not been stuck in a traffic jam, let alone seeing a street that was empty. Um, that's the impact of what's happened with COVID. Of course, it has a ripple through a lot of things and not all of them are gonna revert. Um, technology spreading widely, rapidly. Here's an example that I thought would be fun and different because uh, I, I do a lot of work in the food and ag sector. Uh, People say, oh, food and ag, we're going to see robotics in sort of the field and hydration and sort of mechanization of uh, fertilizer delivery. Well, it's also happening in things like livestock and food technology. So here we go. We know that genetic modification is coming to animals. You can pass judgment on that. There's a whole bunch of values to question there, et cetera. But here's an example. Two salmon, same exact age. The one behind has been genetically modified. And so what does that do to sort of food supply? Could we increase supply with technology? We know what's happening in the sort of land of alternative meats, whether it's the plant-based meats or there's also lab-grown meats that are actually cells of living beings or living animals. And so, you know, we're, we're seeing some innovation and in technology there in a domain that people had previously thought was off limits. You know, have more mouths, more food. Yeah, well, we might produce the food differently. Uh, Automation spreading, we know that. Robots, they're coming. Now you might say, so what? We know technology is taking jobs away, there's readjustment, et cetera. However, the implications at the grandest level are pretty profound. Think about what India has to face. China took its farmers, put them in factories, grew a middle class that was able to spend and produce a self-sustaining economic engine. India is at that stage where they want to take the unskilled, illiterate farm workers and put them in factories to build that middle class, except they're competing against these robots. And so I'm not sure India will truly develop a middle class the way China did through an industrialization based strategy because of technology and demographics interacting in this way. And then, of course, the big elephant in the room that we have to address, and again, happy to delve deeper later if people wish, is the US-China rivalry. This is likely to be, I think, the defining and overarching issue of the day for possibly the next decade, right? This is great power rivalry. It's been dismissed as just a tech war. Oh, it's just about 5G. Eh, it's more than 5G. This is just a space race. Yeah, more than just a space race. This is an economic race. Of course it is. Is it a currency war? Yes. Is it? It's all of the above. This is great power rivalry. And so that has with it a whole bunch of implications. Um, and those implications, I think, stem from this architecture that has been promoted around the world for the last 40 plus years, driven by this idea that free markets uh, should lower costs and that the world is one. That logic has led to supply chain strategies that are organized around lowest cost, just in time, most efficient architectures. And so that meant if you meandered through Asia to come eventually to the West Coast and assembly was done and final product eventually here, that's how they were organized. However, now you then had, that was the way they were organized. Then you had the trade war. And so this little widget that was coming from China that was $4 suddenly turned into being $35. Well, that changed my business model on the product that I was putting together. Okay, I got to adjust my supply chain. And then you, you adapt and you sort of say, okay, we'll still keep that piece there for a little bit. But then you had COVID. And then that $4 part, which they were charging you $35 for because of the tariffs, turned out to not even be available. And so the supply chain logic shifted towards, you know what? I'm done with just in time. Now I need just in case. I need most resilient supply chain architectures. And by the way, it's not just uh, COVID and the trade war that's driving it. Think about the ESG and the climate change focus that's increasingly entering the scene. 
right? Which is increasing pressure on boardrooms to say, what's your carbon footprint? Well, a longer supply chain has a longer carbon footprint. And so we're seeing those pressures. Then there's national security implications of interfacing with the Chinese ecosystem, right? Here's an example. 90, these are percentages of those products that come, apologies for my US centric view here, but that come to the US. So 95% of the ibuprofen in the United States is sourced from China. 90% of the vitamin C and 97% of the antibiotics come from China. This is a vulnerability that in a national security sense needs to be addressed and is being addressed. And so those supply chains are gonna come back home, uh, come back here to North America. And so I'm not suggesting globalization's dead, but I am suggesting that we may in fact see two global economies, one that's a Chinese led ecosystem and another that may be a Western led ecosystem. And when you do that, there are some really interesting implications if you hypo hypothetically play that out uh, in, in terms of economic industries and other things that, that sort of are imbalanced, right? That are on one side of the ecosystem, they're in one ecosystem in oversupply and in, in, on the other ecosystem, they're undersupplied and that creates some interesting vulnerabilities, risks and opportunities, frankly. Um, and so really quickly, I'll suggest that, you know, when you combine the United States, uh, Canada and Latin America, and then throw in Australia, suddenly the Western ecosystem has plenty of agriculture and food while the Chinese or the Eastern ecosystem will be insufficiently supplied given their populations relative to the food supplies they have there. Well, that's pretty interesting. I talked about what's happening with uh, some of the pharmaceuticals or vitamins, um, but then there's also the dynamic of what's happening with rare earth materials. This is another popular one. Uh, China has most of the processing capacity for rare earth metals. Uh, and that produces a vulnerability because rare earth metals are essential for the electrification, the power storage, the magnets, so electric vehicles, but also it has a lot of defense industry implications. And if you're going into a dynamic of escalating tensions, that's not a vulnerability that's wanted. So we're going to see those supply chains return back here, I believe, towards North America. Um, and so anyway, those were my organized comments. Uh, I'm going to leave you with this last quote here, which I think captures the essence of it. You can suggest we're in changing times, the times are turbulent. The truth is, we've always had change. The world is never static. We're always entering some form of turbulence somewhere. The difference is we have to adjust how we think about the world we're in and the dynamics facing it. And so, you know, I think the danger is not the turbulence, it's how we're thinking about it. Um, and so with that, Teresa, I think I spent, uh, I don't know, what was it, 15 to 18 minutes there, something like that. So I, I tried to stay within the constraint you gave me and I'm thrilled to hear if there are any questions uh, and I'll stop the screen share here. So thank you. Thank you, Vikram, for taking us on that uh, worldwide journey. I think it, it, it certainly helps um, bring to life what you're uh, speaking about in terms of having a wide range of perspectives to consider when figuring out how to move forward in the world or what's happening within a particular industry. And um, I would ask, and we'll watch as the questions come in about, um, any advice that you have for um, for viewers who perhaps are you know get their news from one source or um, only rely on specific places to get information because we are all feeling overwhelmed by information. So, what yeah. are your thoughts about that to help us think for ourselves and find um, applicable sources of information? Yeah, no, it's a great question, Teresa. Look, I really believe. That, and I'll say it in terms of perspectives, and then we can connect the dot to, to information sources, but every single perspective is biased, every single perspective is limited, and therefore every single perspective is incomplete. Likewise, most information that we're getting is limited. And so my approach has always been to triangulate through multiple sources and multiple lenses. And if that on a sort of a news flow basis, it means if you're predisposed to listening to something like a CNN, you might also, I'm not suggesting that you need to agree with it, but you might also occasionally listen a little bit to what Fox News is saying. You might also alternate between conservative and liberal 
just because you want to see the mosaic of possibilities and develop an appreciation for views other than your own. No reason you need to agree with it, but having an awareness of it rather than getting caught in these filter bubbles. I think that really is critical if you want to learn to think for yourself in this age where people are filtering information for you, you need to break the filters or have multiple different unconnected filters so you can see the mosaic yourself. Fantastic, thank you. And um, we would, um, oh, I'll check in with this question here. Uh, yeah. There's a question about um, the housing bubble. Uh, you've yeah. talked about a housing bubble in Canada in the past and things have actually gotten worse since, is this perspective? Uh, yeah. What are your thoughts about that? Yeah, it's funny. I wrote a piece in 2000, I think it was 2015. Um, and uh, to my Canadian friends, I apologize for adding this little tidbit at the end of the headline, but I said, crazy Canadian credit confronts crude. And then I was like, A, eh? so I had to add that little bit on the end of the headline. <laughs> uh, but look, it, it yes, it, it's gotten worse, but there was a blip there. I mean, look, I was very concerned about Calgary specifically because, and, and Calgary prices did fall dramatically, uh, but I was also concerned about Vancouver and they rose dramatically. So, you know, uh, there are different cross currents here at work. Fundamentally, I have a strong belief that when money is mispriced, it tends to be misused. And so the question is, are prices of money, and you can argue that's interest rates, uh, that if interest rates stay longer or lower for longer, then asset prices go up higher. Uh, the question then becomes, what will change that interest rate perspective that may put the sort of prick, if you will, in the, what might be a housing bubble to help it deflate? Uh, one possibility is inflation. Uh, I just articulated a story of increasing friction, right? There's a lot of deflation, but recreating supply chains more domestically or, or regionally, et cetera, that's a rebuild process. There's a lot of investment that needs to take place. That's friction. Um, so that actually is what you want to get this supply demand imbalance put together. Throw on top of that uh, some of the new frictions that have emerged because of COVID. And you can imagine there's a couple of worlds scenarios where you can see some inflation rearing its ugly head. Um, in fact, I think you'll see some here in the next three to four months. Um, that may be just mathematically certain in the sense that last year was so low and that year over year inflation will show high because we're back to normal. But anyway, uh, we're going to see some inflation. The question is whether or not that spooks regulators, whether that spooks uh, bond markets. And if it does, you can imagine interest rates rising. I mean, here in the United States, mortgage rates have risen recently, and we've seen a plunge in housing you know, permits for new building. I and mean, just today there was data on this. Um, and so we know there's a lot of sensitivity to that interest rate relating to housing prices and housing activity. So, uh, you know, we got to watch it. I don't have an answer for you as to what's going to cause it and when, but, you know, there's, there's a couple of road signs to watch as we go down that road. And keep paying attention. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, uh, there you talked about rebuilding and there's a question from Emily about if someone had to reinvent themselves in the new world yeah. with the economy and the workplace being more competitive, what do you think they should do to prepare themselves? Yeah, so it's interesting. I think one of the things that's the new skill, if you will, uh, that, that you could argue whether it's a skill, but it's but it's being broad rather than deep. Right. So there's this devotion we've developed over the last 40, 50 years that deep expertise, comp core competence, sort of a, a narrow and deep, that's how you distinguish yourself. Um, the problem is within those worlds, things are automatable, technologies are entering, artificial intelligence is coming, and where the value that's being lost is across these silos, so to say. So the context, who understands the context? And that actually becomes critical. So it's, it's like a trivial uh, way to say it, but I would encourage you to be broader uh, and, and think wider and bring context to whatever role or capacity you choose to go down. So if you're trying to reinvent yourself, I mean, it sounds really crazy, but read novels, right? I just read a novel, 2034, this book by Admiral uh, uh, Jim Stavridis, um, who was the NATO Supreme Commander. And he wrote a novel about World War III, which was going to be US versus China, um, and it sort of plays it out. Well, that made me think differently. I have a different appreciation for context and that may change my view of 
trade patterns. That may change my view of how Taiwan fits into the mix of global affairs. And if you are a semiconductor or you utilize semiconductors in your supply chain of your industry, well, that may change what you think there because there are a lot of foundries in Taiwan and some of the big companies are there, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I would suggest broadening rather than deepening and, uh, and still have fun with it, <laughs> right? So yeah. I think that's always important. Yes, and it makes me think of the uh, image that you have behind you. Oh, yes, the fox. <laughs> yes, your fox. Can you share a bit about that? Because I yeah, know that's the meaning. Yeah, no, look, so long time ago, 2,500 years ago or something like that, there was a Greek uh, poet, Archilochus, who wrote uh, that, I, I'm, I'm not getting the quote exactly here, but it was the fox knows many things and the hedgehog knows one big thing, or maybe it's the opposite. The hedgehog knows one big thing and the fox knows many little things. And the one big thing logic over the last 25 years has been equated with expertise and, and sort of deep knowledge. Um, and the fox, lots of little things, has been equated with a generalist logic and knowing and having an emphasis on breadth rather than depth. Uh, and so I think of myself as someone who is not expert really in very much, but has some appreciation for a lot. Um, and so I think of myself as more in that fox domain, and I also elevate it by putting up the fox here on my wall. So there you go. Fantastic. I think it's helpful for navigating uncertainty that to, to connect dots and see context. Uh, so it depends on your domain, uh, obviously. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have a question about um, you touched on the food and egg sectors. Um, can you elaborate a bit on where you think that's going in terms of uh, whether it's um, in North America or yeah. the impact of the US-China approach? Sure. So I think, uh, look, ag has, I think, a very, very bright future. Uh, there's a lot of demand uh, that you can imagine forthcoming, depending upon what you're talking about. If you're talking, and I'm going to go regional here, like if you're a Canadian asking about Saskatchewan, I'll say, yes, great. Fertilizer, fertilizer inputs, awesome. They're going to be fabulously in demand for the near term into the medium term. I see no reason they wouldn't be in the long term. Uh, there's more people on the plant. They need to eat. The raw ingredients of the food tend to be these predominantly row crops, but not necessarily only. Um, and whether they go into these alternative meats or whether they go into the real animals to turn into meat, there may be some delta in demand because of those changes, but there's a long structural demand story. So I am very bullish ag, uh, and I think ag is, is, is a great place to be. As a commodity, it's also very exciting because it's a hedge against inflation. It's a real asset. People need it. It's sort of going back to primary wealth rather than secondary or you know financial or some other paper wealth. This is like real substantive stuff that we need in the world. So I'm very bullish ag. In terms of how US China comes into play, this is a thesis I've been working on. Um, and so real-time thinking here, I, I, I don't wanna uh, be held to this, but I can imagine a scenario where the ag industry develops the ability to have strategic non-economic pricing. What do I mean by that? Let's say it's canola, so we're, uh, canola or corn, um, and uh, we have it, they want it. And traditionally supply and demand curves would intersect and you'd say, okay, that corn should be $3. And, but with the, this sort of line between the ecosystems, crossing the ecosystem is a negotiation. And so it could be that they say, you know, we need corn, you have it. In our models, it says worth $3, but we say, you know what, it's $10. You don't want it, don't take it. Go find it somewhere else. Well, there's no place else to get it in the volume that they need. And so strategic pricing is an amazing possibility of possible bullishness for the ag sector. So that's one way it could play out. Um, you know, a lot of different ways, hard to know. Thank you. Thanks. I'm going to uh, try to squeeze in one more question before we yeah. wrap. Um, and it's in relation to COVID. Uh, so COVID and its impact on you were talking about supply and demand um, and concerns over scarcity for things like vaccines. Yeah. Um, what are your thoughts about that? Sure. So scarcity of things, well, vaccines, I think there's a global effort focused on development of vaccines and sufficient volume and availability to get it out there quickly. Um, I think that process has actually been really useful for developing a resilience and capacity to deal with future potential public health challenges or even 
mutations or variants of the existing COVID situation. So, you know, I think that we've done a reasonable job of that. There's going to be frictions. It's not always perfect, uh, but we'll get it out there. And my suspicion is we'll figure it out. And, you know, a year from now, we won't be talking about vaccine scarcity. However, we might be talking about different scarcity uh, that, that emerges. And there's always something that's scarce or there's some problem or some bottleneck or what have you. Um, and so, you know, there's a lot of extra supply and things like travel, leisure, and sort of services, if you will. And then from a goods perspective, there may be new areas of scarcity. I mentioned rare earth and rare metals. Again, same way I talked about uh, corn or ag getting strategic pricing on the east, you know, the sort of Western ecosystem selling to the Eastern ecosystem. Likewise, we need some of these rare earth metals for magnets, for electric vehicles, for defense applications, et cetera, here in the Western hemisphere. The Eastern hemisphere produces it. Could they hold us hostage in a similar way? Unclear. So there could be scarcity in different reasons. There could be scarcity emerging in different ways for different reasons, uh, but you know, there'll always be some area of scarcity. Thank you for um, your attention to all the questions that have come in uh, so Great. far. And uh, I know we all look forward to continuing to follow your work. And we'll be sure to share um, the recording of this session with um, attendees so that they can revisit it, wrap their heads around a bit more, and perhaps share with other members of their team. And uh, in addition, as an extension, uh, we are happy to uh, do our book draw. So I will share my screen now so that you can see our book draw names. And so everyone who registered has their name in here and we'll do a quick spin of the wheel. There's one way to resolve uncertainty. Yes. <laughs> well, like that, Liz A has won a copy of your book. Um, so we will um, get that out to Liz post event. And, um, and again, thank you so much for the opportunity to hear about a range of perspectives and, and experiences influencing um, our future and uh, just ways to give ourselves more confidence about um, how to move forward in the world. Um, thank you again for joining us. Uh, so appreciate it. And uh, you've done some great work with uh, so many of our clients uh, as a speaker for them. And we look forward to bringing you to more audiences and, uh, and organizations. We can all be uh, even more informed uh, going forward. Great. Thanks, Teresa. I really enjoyed the conversation. Thanks again, Vikram, and thanks to everyone who joined us today. Um, we are here to help you anytime and uh, look forward to any last comments in the chat about what resonated with you. And uh, we'll be sure to send you our invite for our next session. Thanks again, all. Take care.